Michael, are you ready soon? Lisa peeked into the office. Steve, we decided to have lunch at the cafe today. Are you joining us? Michael asked. You guys go ahead, I'll work a bit more, Steve said, barely suppressing a groan. Oh, you look pale. Are you okay? Lisa approached his desk. Steve clenched his teeth against another wave of pain and involuntarily pressed his palm to the left side of his chest. Is it your heart? You're sweating. Michael, should we call an ambulance? Lisa looked helplessly at Steve. Don't call an ambulance, it'll pass in a moment, Steve said, exhaling. Oh, you look really unwell. Listen, go home, and we'll cover for you if anything happens. Can you drive yourself, or should I give you a ride? Michael suggested. You're a true friend, Steve gratefully looked at Michael, then turned his gaze to the distressed Lisa. Guys, go to the cafe, I'm feeling better, really. Steve made an effort, removed his hand and even managed to smile. All right, you take care and go home. Don't be a hero, Michael said. Steve grabbed his jacket from the cupboard, glanced at Michael one last time, and left the office. Steve wiped his forehead. He sat still, listening to himself. The piercing heartache was replaced by a dull, lingering pain. It's getting better. Steve turned off the computer, carefully stood up from the desk, put on his jacket, and left the office. It was quite natural to walk through the corridor during the lunch break. The dull pain in his heart didn't let up but also didn't intensify. It's nothing, I'll rest, and it will pass. It's all because of the coffee. Time to stop drinking it by the leaders Steve reflected as he sat in the car on the way home. They studied together at the Institute, although in different groups. Fortunately, the three of them successfully landed jobs in the same office but in different departments. Steve knew that Lisa liked him, and Michael was fond of Lisa. Such is life. Michael didn't show his sympathy to Lisa. As a true friend, he stayed on the sidelines, yielding the priority to the more charming Steve. But one day, the unexpected happened. Steve fell in love. One day, he was walking from the Institute and saw a red-haired girl coming towards him. Their eyes met, and Steve realized he couldn't go on living if he passed by. Normally reserved, he approached her and introduced himself. Love hit him like a storm, making him forget about everything else. Steve had his own apartment, almost the only one in the entire course. It was inherited from his mother's sister, who had been ill for a long time and passed away. She had neither a husband nor children. In that apartment, Steve and Amanda indulged in sin, often skipping not only lectures but also classes. In the heat of another passion, Steve confessed his love to Amanda. The proposal slipped off his tongue to live a long, happy life, have children and die on the same day because life without Amanda seemed meaningless. In no time, he found himself a married man. After the wedding, enlightenment and disappointment quickly followed. Amanda suddenly became reserved, refused intimacy, citing headaches and fatigue, which quickly vanished when Steve gave her gifts. Initially, it was flowers and dinner at a cafe, but the gifts became more significant and expensive. Where could a final year student get the money? His parents provided a little, but Amanda's appetites grew. Steve had to find a job. After classes, he rushed to work, came home exhausted and hungry, and collapsed into bed. Amanda was angry. In short, the hasty marriage began to show cracks. Amanda already cooked poorly, and now she stopped altogether. By the way, she managed to spoil even fried potatoes. You come in and immediately lie down to sleep. Why should I slave away at the stove? I don't see you at all, she pouted offendedly. I'm trying for you. 
You wanted a fur coat, Steve justified himself. Why do I need a coat if there's nowhere to go in it? When was the last time we went somewhere together Amanda got worked up? Eventually, Steve got tired of it all. Passion turned into dissatisfaction, fatigue, and misunderstanding. He often wondered, where did love go? How did he manage to get into such a mess? Meanwhile, Michael was comforting Lisa, who was suffering from unrequited love. So, when his heart ached at work, Steve wasn't scared. He even thought that dying would be the best way to solve all the problems at once. The elevator cabin finally descended to the first floor. Steve entered and pressed his back against the wall. The doors closed, the cabin jerked and started going up. Steve exited on the sixth floor, opened the door, and stumbled into the apartment. As he hung his jacket on the hook, he noticed his wife's coat on the hanger along with a stranger's leather jacket. He was surprised that Amanda wasn't at work. She hadn't warned him about anything like this in the morning and seemed perfectly healthy. Steve listened. No sound came from the closed door to the room. He stood there, holding onto the cool metal handle, then abruptly opened the door. Two naked bodies entwined on the disheveled sofa among crumpled sheets. The bright spot of Amanda's red hair was scattered across the pillow. The pain in his heart returned at the sight, so intense that Steve couldn't take a breath. Darkness crept into his eyes. He leaned against the door frame. Before he disconnected, he saw Amanda's eyes widened with horror. Darkness was replaced by light. Steve stepped into that light and found himself on the road. Before him stretched an endless field of wheat, among which bright blue flowers flickered. He knew this field, this place. If he looked to the left, he would see the roofs of the village houses, where he spent his school vacations with his grandmother every summer. Steve turned his head, but there were no houses. Instead of the village, the same wheat field stretched into the distance. He looked around. Indeed, on the other side of the road stood a wall of forest. Steve looked down. He stood barefoot but didn't feel any unevenness or small stones. The light was pleasant, warm, but there was no sun in the sky and no wind. No birds could be heard. The air stood still, making everything look like a painting, lifeless. Then the light disappeared. When it reappeared, Steve found himself in the same place, on the road. Before him was a wheat field. He started walking along it. There appeared a bridge over a ravine. Steve remembered it. At the bottom of the ravine flowed a small stream. During rain, the ravine filled with water, and the stream turned into a river that often flooded the bridge. Steve didn't understand how he ended up here. There was no one to ask. You can't go any further. I tried a pleasant girlish voice sounded nearby. Steve stopped and saw a girl. She sat on the edge of the bridge, dangling her legs. Wheat colored hair cascaded over her shoulders. Blue eyes on light skin looked like lakes. He had never seen such a beautiful girl, not even close to Amanda. Steve could swear that a second ago there was no girl here. Where did she come from? He approached and sat down with her. Suddenly he became afraid that the lights might go out again, and he wouldn't see the girl anymore. Panic gripped him. Steve tried to take a breath but couldn't. He knew he should be breathing, but the more he tried, the stronger and more unbearable the pain in his chest became. Doctor, he's awake. Hurry a familiar voice exclaimed, and the chest pain abruptly stopped. Steve opened his eyes and immediately closed them again, blinded by the bright light. Breathing wasn't painful now, but it felt heavy, as if his chest were pressed by a weight. He opened his eyes again. Steve, you scared me so much Amanda leaned over him. What's happening to me, Steve asked, making an effort. The words scratched his throat like glass. 
You don't remember, Amanda asked. I found you on the floor when I came home from work. I called an ambulance. You were in a coma for three days. I'm so glad you're back. Steve felt his wife squeeze his hand. That's enough, he needs rest. He's still too weak, said a doctor, appearing next to Amanda's head. Come back tomorrow. Don't worry, everything will be fine now. Amanda and the doctor disappeared. Steve closed his eyes, hoping to find himself back on the bridge over the ravine by the wheat field with the blue-eyed girl, but he just fell asleep without dreams and woke up feeling much better. Amanda visited every day. She thought he didn't remember, but he did, just lacking the strength to discuss it. After resting during the day, he pondered his life at night. His mom was right Steve rushed into marriage, in the hospital and his wife was at home, alone or with someone else in their bed. Thinking about it was unbearable. The doctor said not to worry heart issues were no joke. Steve began to believe that life gave him a second chance for a reason. He needed to make things right, start fresh. Returning from the hospital, Steve inadvertently looked at the coat rack. There was no stranger's leather jacket on the hook, but there was. He wouldn't forget. In the fridge, there was food, no longer fresh. He would have liked something homemade to eat now, but Amanda hadn't prepared anything for his return. After being discharged, Steve spent two more weeks at home, sleeping and strolling. One night, Amanda pressed against him, saying she missed him. Steve replied that the doctor advised avoiding any exertion for the time being. Amanda sighed and moved away. She didn't bother him anymore, and that suited Steve. In the morning, he told her he remembered everything and couldn't forget, couldn't live with her as before. I think we need to part ways, Steve said. Amanda tried to justify herself, cried, but then packed her things and left, probably to him. Steve breathed freer, as if he had rid himself of a heavy burden. He returned to work and learned that Lisa and Michael had filed marriage papers. You recovered just in time. We're getting married in a month and a half prepare a gift with Amanda Michael shared his joy. They still didn't know that Steve and Amanda were getting divorced. Back in the hospital, the doctor explained to Steve that when people are in a coma, they seem to enter another world, even encountering those in a similar condition. However, upon waking up, they forget everything. The chance of meeting them in real life is zero. But Steve didn't forget the girl. Walking down the street, he involuntarily scrutinized women's faces. New Year and a friend's wedding were approaching. On the weekend, Steve went shopping for a wedding gift. Time was running out. Passing by a jewelry store, he succumbed to some inexplicable impulse and went inside. He strolled slowly past glass showcases, examining sparkling rings and earrings on red velvet. Do you have something specific in mind? The saleswoman asked. Steve lifted his eyes to her and froze. It was the same girl from the coma. Wheat colored hair, blue eyes, it was her. His heart skipped a beat, and Steve felt the pain returning. He even leaned on the counter to avoid falling. But his heart was beating without pain, only faster. Show me something. Are you choosing a gift for your wife or girlfriend? She inquired, looking at him questioningly while he remained silent. What would you recommend for a beautiful girl? Steve finally remembered to ask. It's a matter of taste. I like this ring, she said, taking out a delicate ring with a bluish stone from under the glass. Look, the girl began to explain why she preferred this particular ring, but Steve couldn't take his eyes off her fingers. What size is your girlfriend? He hoarsely said, clearing his throat. I don't know, Steve replied, and she suggested, try it on. I'll see the girl put on the ring, moved her hand and showed it to Steve. A beautiful gift. Your girlfriend will like it. 
Anything else to show she asked. No, that's it. I'll take this Steve hastily replied. While he paid at the cash register, the girl packed the ring in a velvet box and handed him the gift bag. He gave her the receipt, held the bag, reading the name on her badge. It's for you, Elizabeth. You liked it, and I don't have a girlfriend. Elizabeth immediately became serious. I can't accept it, this is not allowed. There are cameras everywhere. I paid for it, I didn't steal it. Please take it, Steve said hurriedly, heading towards the door before Elizabeth could recover. The next day he returned to the store at the end of its working hours. Elizabeth was showing a couple engagement rings, she immediately noticed Steve but continued assisting other customers. Another girl hurried towards him, but Steve stopped her with a gesture. Twenty minutes felt like an eternity for Steve. Finally, the couple chose rings, made their payment, and left. Steve approached Elizabeth and placed a bouquet of roses on the counter. Thank you, of course, but I don't understand, Elizabeth exclaimed. You recognized me instantly, too. No, I don't know you, Elizabeth said somewhat uncertainly. I'm Steve. I've been looking for you. I accidentally walked into the store and recognized you immediately. I'll wait for you outside, Steve explained. It was cold. Steve was getting impatient when Elizabeth emerged from the jewelry store. The security guard locked the door behind her, hung a closed sign, and looked at Steve through the glass. Steve smiled at the guard. They slowly walked to Elizabeth's home and talked. Steve told her about their encounter on the bridge. When was it? The date Elizabeth asked excitedly, even stopping in her tracks. The incident happened on September 12th. The doctor said I was in a coma for three days, but I didn't see you immediately, maybe on the second or third day. You told me back then that I couldn't go beyond the bridge, that you had tried. I sat next to you at and then you disappeared. Don't you remember? How could you end up with me in my dream? I was hit by a car on the 13th, and the doctors said my heart stopped during the operation. I was in a coma for several hours. I don't remember anything, but your face did seem familiar, but I can't recall where I saw you, Elizabeth explained. Where were you hit by a car, Steve tried to find out. I was crossing the street on Crosby Street. I live nearby Elizabeth looked skeptically at Steve. We ended up in a coma at the same time I think there's a reason for that. I think it's not a coincidence. A car hit you and I caught my wife with her lover and I had a heart attack. I'm even grateful to my wife for that otherwise I wouldn't have met you Steve confessed. Your married Elizabeth asked in a faltering voice. Not anymore. I got divorced two weeks ago, six months later. Steve and Elizabeth got married, and a year later they welcomed their daughter, Eva. Why Eva Elizabeth asked, smiling at her husband and holding the tiny baby close to her chest. Hello, I knew that sooner or later we would definitely meet. How are you alone? She asked, clearly delighted by their encounter. Steve was studying his ex-wife and wondered where his eyes had been before. There was nothing special about her. And her hair was not red but dyed. I got married, I have a daughter growing up, and you? I am alone. Amanda immediately seemed to shrink. You lost him, and he turned out not to need you. She walked away with her shoulders drooping. Steve felt sorry for her as a human, but he regretted nothing. Eve and Elizabeth were waiting for him at home, in their family paradise. You find only when you don't know what you're looking for, and you often realize that you've found it only when you've already lost it. If you live to be a hundred, I want to live to be a hundred minus one day so that I never have to live without you. Dear friends, if you like this story, subscribe to my channel. Like and be sure to write your opinion in the comments. 
I sincerely wish you all the best, strong health, a peaceful sky above your head, and a good mood.